What I've got to say though is having used lambdas and streams for about a year now in kind of real programming, I do find that it's incredibly powerful and the code that you write now is, is really quite elegant. So as we'll see as we go through it, it's a really very useful feature. So the first thing I have to put up is the usual Oracle legal slide which basically says that we are not committing to deliver anything on a particular date. Now, given that we launched Java SE8 about a year ago, I think we're fairly safe on that, so we'll just kind of move past that. Now, big question is why do we need Lambda expressions and the stream API in Java? Java is nearly 20 years old, and we've been using Java for nearly 20 years. We can write any program we like in Java. So why do we need this new feature? The reality is that most machines these days, in fact pretty much any machine, is going to be multi-core and possibly multi-processor. What that means is that you have to <coughs> learn how to use threads. You have to learn how to use multi-processing, parallel ways of programming. And if you look at the history of Java, we kind of take different approaches to that to make it easier for you as developers. Back in JDK 1.0, one of the things that Java had was the idea of threads. So you could actually create a separate thread of execution and have different parts of your program effectively work in parallel. The problem comes in doing that in how you get threads to coordinate their actions. Because having threads that run in parallel is all well and good. But most of the time, what you need to do is to coordinate those things. So you have data being processed in one, results being passed to another, and things like that. So in JDK 1.0, we didn't really have any powerful features to do that. If you look at the thread class, there are effectively only four methods that you can use to coordinate different threads. That's sleep, interrupt, wait, and notify. And then you've got things like synchronized blocks, you've got things like synchronized methods, you've got volatile variables. So very basic ways of coordinating how threads work together. Now, with that in mind, in Java SE 5, we introduced the concurrency utilities. This was JSR 166. What that did was to introduce a very big set of APIs, which gave you a very useful set of tools for writing parallel code. And we gave you things which most people are familiar with when it comes to writing parallel code. Things like semaphores, things like mutexes, rewrite logs, atomic operations, all of those types of things. So that was good. Made life a lot easier. You could write more reliable parallel code. <coughs> it's still pretty difficult. In Java SE 6, we added a few more things, some more sophisticated things like phasers, which gave you different ways of, of allowing threads to execute in parallel and then kind of arrive at the same point. Java SE 7, we had another go at it. So we introduced the fork join framework. And the idea there is that you could take a single task, which can be broken up into smaller tasks. And you can do that recursively until you get to a small enough task to execute a single thread. The framework deals with all the hard stuff for you. So it creates a pool of threads, it manages the queues associated with those threads. You simply specify how to break up the job into smaller and smaller units and at what point to execute within a thread. So again, very useful, certainly for specific types of, of problems, but still, you know, still not quite easy enough to do certain things. When we were planning Java SE 8, we looked at what we could do next to make it easier to use all these processors. And what we decided was that we couldn't simply add a new set of APIs. We had to do something different as well. We had to change the language, the syntax of Java, because then we could add some new APIs using that new syntax. And that's what Lambda Expressions is all about, changing the syntax to make life easier for parallel code. Let's talk about lambdas then. What is a lambda expression? Let's start with a very simple problem. 
that we might want to solve in Java. Now, let's say I have a collection of data. We do this all the time. A collection of data, I want to do something with that data. I want to find something from that collection. So what I've got here is a simple piece of code <coughs> where I've got a collection of results from students who've taken exams. And what I want to do is I want to find what was the highest score that any student got in the year 2011. So I've written Java code as we understand it before Java SE8 to do that. And this is great. It works perfectly. I have my collection of students. I then have a for loop. And I use the uh, for each syntax, so I can iterate over my collection of students. I set a high score value, so I can record the high score. And then in my iteration, in my for loop, I simply say, is the graduation year 2011? If it is, check the high score against my current high score. If it's higher, change the value, move on. So we can see that, that that's going to work. Very simple piece of code, very powerful, does exactly what we want. That's good. So what's the problem with this? Why would we want to change this? Well, the issue is, if we want to take advantage of multiple cores and multiple processes, what we're doing here is we're restricting what the compiler can do, because we have specified a for loop. We've specified the way that the iterator works with that for loop. And that really is a contract between us, the programmer, and the system, which says, that in order to process this, you must iterate over this collection in the order that the iterator works. So it will just give you the, the results as the iterator delivers them. And it will process them in that way. But if we want to make that parallel, we can't, it, it's pretty much impossible to break that into parallel tasks. Because if we break it into parallel tasks, we're going to introduce non-deterministic behavior. Because the threads might execute differently on different processes and so on. And the order in which those things get processed could change. But we have a contract with that for loop which says they must be processed in this order. Now, even though it doesn't actually matter to our code, because we just want the highest score, what we've effectively done is forced it to do it in a particular order. So we are controlling the iteration. That makes our code inherently serial. We cannot make it parallel without breaking that contract. The other big problem we've got is even if we said, okay, well, let's kind of like modify our for loop, let's try and make it parallel rather than doing it serially, we have a state. We have a variable called highest score. And what that means is that if we have multiple threads, we're all trying to update that simultaneously, we run into the problem of race conditions. We run into the problem of inconsistent data. So to do that properly, we need to introduce locking, contention, all sorts of extra code, and, and making it very messy. So whilst this solves our problem, it only solves it in a single threaded environment. So we can't easily make it multi-threaded. Let's rewrite that code. Let's rewrite it still using Java as we know it before Java SE8, but eliminate the for loop and eliminates the state. So I've done that here. What I've effectively done is said, okay, let's take our collection of students, but now we're going to chain together some method calls. So I'm going to call a new method called filter. And filter is going to take an interface as a parameter. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use an anonymous inner class to implement that. <coughs> We've had these from way back in Java 1.1. So I say, okay, new predicate, which is the name of the interface of type student, and then I implement the single method op on that student. And all that's going to do is determine whether the graduation year was 2011 or not. Same as our if statement in the previous slide. So the output from filter is going to be a subset of our collection of only the students who graduated in the year 2011. Good. We're then going to pass that set of results to another method called map. And map, same approach, takes an interface as a parameter. We use an anonymous inner class to implement the mapper interface. There's a single method called extract. And what we do from that is to return the score of that student. 
So what we get from that is a collection of the scores that the students who graduated in 2011 got. Great. And then we pass that into another method, which is, is effectively a reduced method, but in this case it's a special form called max. So what that's going to do is going to take all the scores that we've got and give us the highest score maximum value from that collection. So that's great. So now we've solved the problem, but we haven't used the explicit loop. So this is, this is much better, because now iteration, in effect, is being handled internally. What that means is we don't have a contract with the compiler which specifies the order in which that must happen. So things like filter and map, you can decompose those very effectively into parallel threads of execution, and you can have them execute in parallel. So we could do the filter, we could do the map in parallel very easily. We can let the library code handle how that happens. So we no longer have inherently serial code. We also don't have any state, which means we don't have the problem of locking, we don't have the problem of contention. Now again, that can be handled internally, we don't have to worry about it in our code. The other thing we can do is we can let the library code, our filter and map work, do things like lazy evaluation. What we can say is, rather than having to do all of the filtering before we do any of the mapping, we could generate results from filter, pass them as they're created to map, and then we can have those handled as we need to do them. If we weren't looking for something like maps, if we were looking like for the first result that was greater than 90, for example, we can eliminate work by saying, well, as soon as we get a result that's greater than 90, we stop. So rather than doing all the filtering, all the mapping, and then look for the result, we just pass values through, and as soon as we get the value, we stop. So this is all good. This is much, much better than we had before. Problem with that is this code is just plain ugly. Because we're using anonymous inner classes, and anonymous inner classes, <coughs> as you can see, rely on us saying that we are going to implement, in this case, a predicate or a mapper, and we have to specify that that is the type we want to implement. We have to have brackets. We have to specify that the method is called op. It takes a parameter. We have to specify that it's public. It returns a boolean. And then what it actually does. So there's lots of code in there. Lots of brackets and fluff and stuff. And to make that more obvious, what I've done is I've highlighted some of the code. So in this case, you can see that some of it's green and most of it's blue. The green code is the code we actually care about. The blue code is just there to make the green code work. So we don't really care that it's a predicate type student and it's got brackets and it's public and boolean. But we don't really care about that. What we actually need to do is get the, the graduation year of 2011. So what we need is a better way of doing that. And that's what Lambda Expressions is all about. So let's rewrite that same piece of code using Lambda expressions. And here it is. Much simpler, much more concise than we had before. No, not lots of brackets and lots of definitions and things like that. So what have we got here? A Lambda expression, you can think of for now as being like a method. But it's not a method. And I'll explain why it's not a method in a moment. But for now, think of it like a method. So in this case, we've got filter. And the kind of method that we're using here takes a parameter, student s. So the left-hand side of the Lambda expression is the parameters that we're passing to our method-like thing. We have an arrow, which indicates that this is a Lambda expression. And then we have the right-hand side of the Lambda expression, which is, in effect, the body of this method-like thing. So in this case, we're comparing graduation year against 2011. Now you can immediately see that it's not really like a method because there's no explicit return in that. So although we're comparing graduation year to 2011, we're not saying return the result of that. The compiler will infer for us that because we're doing a comparison in that way, that the return type of the Lambda expression will be a Boolean. Similarly, when we use the Lambda expression for the map, we're passing a single method, student s, and the body of the Lambda expression is to return the score of that student. And again, 
the compiler will infer for us that the return type of that Lambda expression will be an int or a double or whatever we've used to store the, the score on that skew. So this is very good, much simpler, much easier to understand. Much more readable, abstract, and because it's simpler, it's much less error prone. So we can, we can take advantage of that. But let's look at some more details about Lambda expressions. So if I said a Lambda expression is like a method, but it's not a method. So what is it if it's not a method? And the answer is that what we're going to call it is an anonymous function. In Java, a method has to be associated with a class. That's object-oriented programming. You have classes, you have objects of those types. And the class has methods to define the behavior of those classes. So a Lambda expression is like a method, but because it's not associated with a class, it's anonymous. We don't call it a method, we call it a function. Structurally, it is exactly the same as a method. So it takes a set of typed parameters, it has a body, it has a return type, and it can potentially throw exceptions. So the structure of the Lambda expression is exactly like we used to with methods. But, and this is the big point, because it doesn't have, it's not associated with a class, it's not a method. The really important thing about this is that what we now have is a simple way of having parameterized behavior, not just values. So we can have a simple way of passing behavior to a method as a parameter rather than just passing a value. We could do this before with anonymous inner classes as we saw, but it, it's messy, it's, you know, it's yucky. So we do it in a simple way now. What this allows us to do is to separate out responsibilities. Now, if we look at again the example that I showed earlier, the filter, map, and max on our collection of students. We've got three methods there. So we're saying filter the students, map the results of those students, and then give us the maximum value. And that is saying what it is that we want to do. So we want to take our collection of students, we want to filter them to find the students who graduated in 2011, we want to map those students into the results they got, and then we want to reduce it to give us our final result. That's what we want to do. The Lambda expressions tell us how we want to do that. So we're saying that how we want to filter is by looking for students who graduated in 2011. How we want to map is to return the score of that student. If I wanted to change the way that worked, so that rather than looking for the highest score that any student got in 2011, I actually wanted to know what was the highest score that any student whose name began with P got, then all I would need to do is change the Lambda expression in the filter. I don't change the structure of the code, I don't change the fact that we're doing filter, map, and max, I just <coughs> change the Lambda expression to change the way that I'm going to do the filtering. This is the really important part. Parameterized behavior and allows us to separate out the what from the how. If a lambda expression is not associated with a class, what's its type? Because Java is a static, strongly typed language. So everything in Java has to have a type associated with it. But if a lambda expression doesn't have a class, what's its type? Well, the answer is that if you look at Java, even before Java SEA, we have lots of interfaces that have a single method associated with them. Things like Runnable has a single method called Run. Things like Action Listener have a single method, Action Form, and so on. And we can use a Lambda expression wherever we have an interface that has a single abstract method. <coughs> So we can use a Lambda expression to, to implement Runnable. We can use a Lambda expression to implement actions. So wherever you have an interface, single method, what we're going to call these is functional interfaces. And you can use a Lambda expression to represent that interface. Now, it's, 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 to, to be 
absolutely precise about this, and it's worth spending a moment to reiterate this. When you use a lambda expression, the lambda expression's type is effectively the type of that interface. But remember, there's no class associated with the lambda expression. So the lambda expression is effectively the implementation of the single method that is contained in that interface. So that's the, the, the subtleness about lambda expressions, is that they're, although they're anonymous, they have a type which is the functional interface. But they themselves represent the implementation of the method associated with that functional interface. Now, if you look at anonymous inner classes, you will know that if you want to refer to values, variables in the surrounding scope, you're limited in what you can do there. And this is one of those things that when you start using anonymous inner classes, and also when you use lambda expressions, you will find that this gets really kind of, well, can get annoying. Because anonymous in a class, if you refer to a value in the surrounding scope, it must be final. So it means you can't change the value in the surrounding scope. You can reference it, but you can't change it. The value must only be set once. And as I say, this can be a bit frustrating at times because you think, oh, I just want to be able to change that value. But this is because with anonymous inner classes and lambda expressions, these are examples of what are called closures. And one of our engineers explained this to me in, in a nice way. He said, what we have in Java is closures over values, not closures over variables. And if you think about it, it actually makes sense. Because if what we're trying to do with this is to make it easier <coughs> to write things that can work in parallel, what you don't want to be doing is modifying state. And that's one of the key things in functional programming is that you shouldn't modify state. Because if you start modifying state, if you were to modify the state of the variable, and you had several threads all doing that at the same time, you'd end up with potentially inconsistent data, break condition, and so on. So in lambda expressions, we have the same restriction, but we've kind of made it a little bit easier for you. So the restriction is that you still can't modify the state of variables from the surrounding scope. But now, rather than actually having to be marked explicitly as final, they only have to behave as if they were marked as final. So we, we use effectively final variables. So the example here, I've got a method called expire. I'm passing in a value called four. And now I want to use that in my lambda expression. I can do that because before doesn't have its value changed. I don't change it in the lambda expression. I don't change it in my code. So <coughs> it is effectively final. Its value is set once and it's not modified. So I can use that in my lambda expression. <coughs> what does this mean for lambdas? Again, we think about anonymous inner classes. If you refer to this in an anonymous inner class, what you're actually doing is referring to the instance of the object, or the instance of the class, which has been created for you by the compiler. So the compiler creates an anonymous inner class with the name of your class, dollar or something, and then creates an instance of that object. So when you refer to this, you're referring to that object. But I said lambda expressions don't have a class associated with them. So this has no meaning in that sense. If you use this in a lambda expression, you will actually refer to the object of the surrounding scope. So this is, this is useful. Here's a piece of code. And this is something that I, I wrote something very similar to this when I was using lambda expressions first, early on. And I wrote this code, and so I had base processor, the current value, I'm using processing, I get some <coughs> data from something, and then I use current value, and I incremented it. And I compiled my code and I ran it, and it worked. I was like, oh, great, yeah, my code works. I always like it when my code works. It's nice when my code works. And then I thought about it, I thought, well, hang on, that shouldn't work. Because I've just told you that you can't 
use a variable from the surrounding scope unless it's effectively final. Now, clearly it's not effectively final because I'm modifying the value by incrementing it. But it compiled and it worked. So I'm like, well, that, that doesn't make any sense. And I had to dig into this and find out why it was that this didn't work. And it turns out there's a sneaky little trick that the compiler does on your behalf. And I'm still not convinced that this is a good thing, even though it's actually very useful because clearly my code worked. What the compiler does, it actually in inserts for you a reference to this. So rather than you referring to current value and incrementing it, what you actually do, invisibly, through the compiler, is refer to this dot current value. Now this is effectively final, so there's no problem with that. So we can then say this dot current value plus plus, and we can increment it. So great, we can get around this this problem of, of not modifying the state in our manner expression. So as I say, this is good because it made my code work. But I'm not convinced that you know, in a multi-threaded environment, this would be a good thing. And so it could introduce some, some problems, because it's not obvious what is happening in this case. So um, I still need to talk to our engineers about this as to why that's, that's a good thing. But anyway, so let's talk about type inference. One of the things we did in Java SE8 was we rewrote a large part of the compiler, specifically so that it would do type inference in a different way. In a better way. Here I've got a method which I've defined which has some generic type parameter associated with it. So I've got generic type parameter t and it's called sort. It's going to take a list of type t and then it's going to take a comparator which is going to compare that list based on some implementation that we want. So the comparator has to be something which is of type t or a superclass of t. Okay, good. If I want to use that, I could do something like this. I could create myself a list of type string and get my list from somewhere. And then I can sort it and I can pass in list as my list parameter. Good. And then I can define a lambda expression to say how I want to sort my list. In this case, it's going to take two parameters, string x and string y, and the body of the lambda expression is simply going to return the difference in length. So I'll be sorting my uh, list of strings by length. So that's all good. But what we can do here is the compiler is now smart enough to say, well, okay, t is definitely string, because clearly I'm passing a list of type t, and my comparator is going to be comparing strings, so it's a comparator of type string. OK, great. So now, for you, the developer, you don't have to specify that x and y are of type string. The compiler will know that for you. So the compiler will say, ah, using a list of type string, x and y must be of type string, so there's no problem. Now, don't worry about this. We are not sneaking in dynamic typing to Java. This is still very much statically typed, still very much strongly typed. But there's no way that x and y are anything but string in this case. It's just that the compiler is inserting the, the string definition for you. What we're really doing here is giving you more typing with less typing. Very bad type. <laughs> Method references. Another thing we've done to make life easier for you is to give you a shortcut in terms of how you can re refer to methods. Because what you often find is a lambda expression looks like this, where you've got a parameter, in this case file f, and all you're doing is returning the result of a single method call on that parameter. So what we can do there is to shorten it by using a method reference. So now, by using the colon colon syntax, we can say file colon colon can read, and that's equivalent to the above lambda, above lambda expression. So it will shorten it, makes it easier. So you, you can see what's going on, it's fairly easy to read, um, and you can understand what's happening there. Constructors are very much like methods, so we can also have a constructor reference. So here I've got 
um, the Lambda expression where what I'm doing is that I'm saying I want to create a new instance of array list of type string. One other thing to note here is that in the case of the parameters that you pass to your Lambda expression, if you have no parameters, or if you have more than one parameter, then you must put brackets. So in this case, there's no parameters, so we have empty brackets. If you have two parameters, like you saw with the comparator, you must have brackets. If you only have one parameter, the brackets are optional. So you can leave the brackets out if there's only one parameter to your Lambda expression. As I say, we can change that to a constructor reference. And so in this case, what we do is we say array list of time string colon colon new to indicate that we're going to create a new instance of that class. So that is Lambda expressions in a kind of nutshell. Let's now look at how we use Lambda expressions in Java SE8 to allow you to simplify multiple processing, parallelism, and so on. What this required us to do was to evolve the way that we have libraries in Java. There was a bit of a change that we made here, which is worth spending a few minutes talking about. The goal that we had was to allow us to do things like this. So I said that you know, effectively what we're trying to do is introduce this sort of chain of method calls, filter, map, reduce, using Lambda expressions, using single abstract method types, functional interfaces. So that's all good. Right, that's fine. But the problem is that what we're actually doing is introducing new methods into the collections API. Because if you think about it, you know, things like list, things like set, they don't have filter, they don't have map, they don't have reduce in them. So we need to go and add those methods to the libraries. How do we do that? Well, if we're talking about you know, classes, it's not too difficult. We can go into the class, we can add new methods, and we can document it, and we can make it available. That's all good. The issue is that in the collections API, most of it's based on interfaces. Collections and interface, lists and interface, sets and interface, and so on. So what we want to do is add new methods to an existing interface. Oh well, yeah, again, we can just go in, we can add new methods, we can document it, and that's all good. Problem is, if I've got a list that I've created based on, let's say, JDK7 list interface, and I create my code, I compile it, put it in a jar file, give it to people to use, good. In Java SE8, somebody comes along and says, ah, I'm going to use Simon's list, and I'm going to use this wonderful new filter map reduce system. So I'm going to use your jar file, I'm going to call reduce on that, I'm going to call filter on that, and off we go. The compiler comes along and says, right, I'm going to call filter, go to Simon's jar file or class, try and resolve that method, but hang on, it's a JDK7 implementation, so there is no filter method there. Can't resolve it, compiler stops. We've just broken backwards compatibility in a massive way, which is really bad because we don't like to do that with Java. You'll notice that we try wherever possible to maintain backwards compatibility. Personally, I like to have code that works and then take it to the next version and then compile it, and it still works. What I don't like to do is take code that works, have to then modify it to make it work in a new version, because it already works, so I don't have to change it. So this is our problem. How do we add new methods to an existing interface without breaking backwards compatibility? And the answer is default methods. So now, in our interface, we can specify a new method, but we can also use a new syntax. So now, same collection interface, we're going to introduce a new method called string, and that's going to return a string of type E. Fine. But because my list might not have an implementation of string, when the compiler comes to use that and I call string on my old list, it's going to go and it's going to say, oh, can't resolve that. But rather than stopping, what it will do is it will go back to the interface and it will say, ah, but you have provided a default implementation. So rather than stopping because it can't resolve that method, it then goes, up. Oh, well, I'll use string support dot string of splitterator to resolve that method. So now we have a way of adding new methods to an interface 
without breaking backwards compatibility because you can specify the default implementation in the interface itself. Now, of course, the observant amongst you will immediately go, well, hang on, just a minute, aren't you now introducing multiple inheritance into Java? And the answer to that is yes and no. Because Java already has multiple inheritance of types. Because if you think about it, if I create a new class, I can do my class foo extends one class. So single inheritance. But I can also implement several interfaces. And when I create an instance of that class, through polymorphism, I can view it either as the class itself or any of the superclasses, but also I can view it as any of the types of the interfaces that I've implemented. So we already have multiple inheritance of types in Java. What default methods is doing is introducing multiple inheritance of behavior to Java. So now we can, we can have behavior coming from a class, or we can have behavior coming from an interface. What we're not doing is introducing multiple inheritance of state. And that's what languages like C++ have. Full multiple inheritance, so you inherit types, behavior, and state. And that's where a lot of the problems come from. Having said that, there are some things you need to be aware of. Because let's say I create a new class called foo, and I implement type A and type B interfaces. All good. And then I've got a, a new method called find in my interfaces, which have default methods associated with them. But both A and B have a default implementation. Now, my class doesn't have find in it. So when the compiler goes to compile that, it's going to go, OK, no find in your class. Go to interface A, ah, oh, you've got a default implementation for find. Go to interface B, oh, you've got a default implementation there as well. So which one does the compiler use? Does it use the first one it finds? Does it use the last one it finds? Does it pick one at random? The answer is, if the compiler can't tell the difference between two default implementations, because they have the same method signature, it will give you an error. So it will say, I can't determine which of these to use. You must modify your code to determine which of those is appropriate. In which case, what you'll have to do is then go and implement find in your class, even if it only just refers back to the implementation in the interface that you want, so A or B. So that's just one kind of place where you might have some, some issues that you need to be aware of. The other thing we did in Java SE 8, because we now have default implementations available in interfaces, so we have got behavior in interface as well as the definitions, we also said that you can now have static interfaces, in, sorry, static methods in an interface as well, because that actually makes sense. So let's, let's just come back to what I said about functional interfaces again. So a functional interface, remember, is one that has, oh, question. Right, so the solution is that if the compiler cannot determine the difference between them because they have the same method signature, it will give you an error. So it will stop compiling. And then what you must do is you must say, well, okay, I will put a find method in my class so that it's defined. The compiler then goes, oh, okay, find is in your class, so it doesn't have to use either of the default implementations. If you want to use one of those default implementations, then you can because you can simply refer to the default implementation from the interface explicitly in your code. So, but you have to change your code to make it obvious whether it's the implementation from A or the implementation from B that you want. Okay. So, as I say, coming back to functional interfaces. Functional interface is one that has a single abstract method in it. Now, this is interesting, you see, because if you look at something like predicate, which is one of the new functional interfaces that was introduced in Java C8, predicate has five methods in it. But it is a functional interface, because one, only one of them is abstract. So how is it that you can have five methods in an interface, and only one of them is abstract? The answer in this case is that three of those methods 
have default implementations. If you have a default implementation, by definition, it's not abstract because it actually has an implementation. And the fifth one is a static method. So that also has an implementation, therefore it's not abstract. So predicate only has one abstract method, but it has five methods, four of which have an implementation. So that's just something to be aware of with functional interface. We've also introduced the idea of an annotation functional interface so that you can mark your interface as being a functional interface and the compiler will check that there is only one abstract method. So, how do we use Lambda expressions and default, implement, default methods to create the streams API? So what is a stream? Well, at a high level, you can think of a stream as, where, as being a way of abstracting aggregate operations over collections. Now, the important thing here is that what we're not talking about is a data structure. Often when you look at streams, they look like data structures, but they're not. They're actually just a way of taking a collection and then processing it according to what you want to do with it. And what they really do is simplify how you actually say what you want to do in terms of the collection. They also give us a lot of opportunities in terms of the underlying code to optimize what's happening for what you're trying to do. So using lazy evaluation, fusing together operations so you're not doing things as distinct um, processing on, on sets of data and so on. The easiest way to think of a stream is like a pipeline. And you can think of the pipeline as having somewhere that the pipeline starts. That's the source of your stream. So you'll have something like a collection or an array or some set of data that's going to give you a source for your stream. What you then do is you take that stream and you pass it through, through zero or more intermediate operations. And an intermediate operation is something which takes as input a stream, does something, and then generates as output the stream. That way, with intermediate operations, you can take the output of one intermediate operation, feed it to the input of another one. When you've done all the intermediate operations that you want, you need to terminate your stream. So you need to get the other end of your pipeline. That's going to produce some kind of result. So you need something which takes as input a stream, but doesn't generate as output another stream. What it will do is it will either generate something which is a result, in the case of a, you know, like an object or a primitive or a collection or whatever, or it could be some kind of side effect. And by side effect, what I mean is it could like do something like print a message. So although it doesn't actually return a result, it does something to indicate that you've finished using that stream. So here, I've got a simple example where I'm taking a set of transactions and what we do is we need to create a source of that stream. So we call stream on the collection. This is a new method in the collections API. So the stream method returns the source, which is our source of the stream. We pass that to an intermediate operation. So we're going to filter it based on an Amber expression, taking our transactions and finding all the transactions that took place in London. Pass the results of that, which is a stream, to another intermediate operation, map to int, which is going to get the prices of those transactions, and pass that into a terminal operation, which in this case is going to reduce, where we're reducing things by adding them together. One thing I will point out here is that I'm using map to int. The reason I'm using map to int rather than map is because in, in Java, obviously we have this difference between objects and primitives. So in the case of map to int, what we're doing is we're explicitly saying, rather than creating a, a stream of objects which happen to be integer values, I want that to be a stream of primitive values, because then that's easier to process. Because if I just said map, what I'd end up with is a, a stream of integer objects, and there'd be boxing of those values into integer objects, and then when I needed to use them, I'd have to unbox them internally and get the value out. So what we're doing there is we're saying, create that stream as a stream of primitive values, and that way we don't have to do boxing and unboxing internally. 
there are lots of ways to create streams. You can use the stream method on collection, and that will generate <coughs> the values from your collection. You can also create a parallel stream. And what parallel stream will do, funnily enough, is process those things in parallel. How that happens is by using the fork joining framework underneath. So the library code will actually take your code, and it will break up the, the collection into a number of parallel streams, and it will have them process in parallel. You don't have to worry about how that actually happens. An array is a collection of data. So if you want to create a stream from an array, you can use the arrays.stream. Or you can create a new one by doing stream.of uh, with your array. There are also some nice static factory methods. So there's things like files.walk, which will return a stream of references to files and directories in your file system based on a path that you specify to a particular point. And if you really want to create your own stream, then you can using a thing called splitterator. But that will take me a long time to explain in terms of how that actually works. So most of the time, you don't need to worry about that because we have provided enough standard classes to allow you to take advantage of that. Terminal operations. Um, one of the things that, when I talk about the way streams work, is I, I explain it as you, you take the stream from the source, you pass it into an intermediate operation, it gets processed, that creates another stream, gets passed to the next intermediate operation, and so on. That's a very easy way to understand effectively what is happening, but it's not what really happens underneath. What really happens underneath is only when you get to the terminal operation will the execution actually be evaluated. At that point, the library code can then decide how best to process what you've specified in your code. Because, as I said, we might want to fuse together operations, we might want to do lazy evaluations, and so on. Uh, I'll give you an example of that when I talk about the examples in a moment where that, that really kind of uh, takes place. Internally as well, we also have a set of characteristics which we apply to strings. What this allows us to do internally is track some of the, the qualities of the string. So there are things like uh, a string can be ordered, a string can be sorted, um, a string can be distinct. So we know that there are no elements which are equal in that string. And that way, if you do something like take a string which we already know is distinct, and you pass it into the distinct method to eliminate any duplicates, we know that we don't have to do any work. So we can simply ignore that method called an effect. Maps and flat maps. So I've talked about maps in some of the examples. And effectively, a map, from a, a mathematical point of view, is a one-to-one -one mapping. Each element on the input stream has something done to it which generates one element on the output stream. So each element, input stream, same number of elements on the output stream. But often there are situations where what we really want to do is to take an input stream and then for each element on that input stream, we do something which creates a set of results. So what we're doing is creating a stream of results for each element on the input stream. If we just left that using map, what we'd end up with is a stream of streams. And what we want is a stream as an output. So flat map, is in effect a one-to-many mapping. So you have a different number of elements on the output stream to the input stream. And the way that that works is that input stream gets processed, each element can produce its own stream of results, and then flat map will concatenate or flatten those results into a single output stream. And again, I'll show you an example of that in a moment, how that, how that actually works. One other thing I want to talk about before we get into some examples is the optional class. And this is related to streams quite closely, although you don't have to use it with streams. If you think about things like min and max, these are terminal operations. So they take an input stream and they look for the minimum value in that input stream or the maximum value in that input stream. But what happens if there are no elements on that input stream? What would you return from that? Well, I mean, you could say, well, I'll return zero because you know that's the minimum or that's the maximum. But that doesn't really make sense if there are no elements on the input stream. 
So what you would really want to return is a null. And we use null references in Java to indicate that. So rather than returning what could potentially be a null, and then having to worry about looking to see if that value is null or not, we use an optional. And an optional is, in effect, a container for an object reference. Because we know that an optional exists, we know that's never going to be null. But what is contained inside the optional could be either a valid reference or it could be null. And by putting it inside the optional, we can then use the methods on the optional object to have to deal with the situation where you may have a null reference without having to explicitly do if reference equals null, do this, l do that type thing. So we end up with a situation where you have an optional. And you could think of an optional like a string which has zero or one elements. So zero elements if it's a null reference, one element if it's a valid reference. And so we have methods, things like if present. What that will do, as you would expect, is if there's a valid reference there, it will use the lambda expression that you pass as a parameter to if present, and it will do something with it. It will use it. You can also have or else, which is the flip side of that, which is basically saying if there is a null reference there, do this. So you can create a new object or something like that. And if you don't care about whether it's a null or not, you can use get, which will actually extract either the null or the reference for you. But you can do more complex things than that. So you can actually do things like filtering. You can even do mapping on an optional. So you could, you could use a filter to say, OK, if there's a result there, does that result have some kind of value associated with it that I'm interested in? In that case, generate another optional which may or may not have results associated with it. So there's interesting ways of combining those things. So some examples of Lambda expressions in use. Let's say I want to take a list of words, I want to convert them all into uppercase. So I take my word list, and I need a source, so I call screen on that. And then I map that using a Lambda expression, which in this case is going to be a method reference, simply say convert those strings to uppercase. What I then want to do is to generate a list as my result. So my terminal operation in this case it's not a reduction, it's a collect. And what collect does is allow you, as the name would suggest, to collect the results together. Collect takes a collector as an argument. That's not a lambda expression, it's actually um, a method reference. And in this case, we've produced a set of utility methods in the collectors class, which allow you to do things that you would want to do. So in this case, I'm going to collect to a list and that will generate a collector, which will take the input stream, create a new list with those elements in it, and return that as your result. So it allows it to work in a nice, simple, straightforward way. Now, let's say I want to do the same thing in parallel. So now all I have to do is say parallel screen rather than parallel. And suddenly, my code is executing parallel using the fork join framework, and you know everything is all good. That's how simple it is to convert from being sequential to being parallel. Now, one thing that's worth pointing out here as well is don't think that wherever you've got a multi-core machine, that just, oh, right, right, make it parallel. It's going to work faster. Because that's not always going to be the case. If WordList had three words in it, the cost of setting up the fault join framework and then having set up all the queues and, and all the, the everything that's associated with it would far outweigh the benefits of doing three elements in parallel. So be a little bit careful if you use you know, streams as to whether it makes sense to use a parallel stream or a serial stream based on how much data you've got. Another example. How about if I want to count the lines in a file? Now, one of the things we've done is in the buffered reader class, we've added a nice new method, which is called lines. And what that will return you is a stream of strings. So if you've got a buffered reader associated with a file, what you're going to get is a stream of the lines in that file. So if I want to count the lines in that file, all I do is I do buffered reader.lines, get my stream source. I don't need any intermediate operations. I just pass that stream into count. And it's going to count 
how many elements there are in the input string. Am I running out of time? Uh, no more than five minutes. <clears throat> Let's make that a little bit more complicated. How about if I want to take lines three and four from a file and join them together? So in this case, same start, buffered reading of lines to get the lines from the file. But now I've got two other methods that I haven't told you about called skip and limit. And what skip will do is it'll take the input stream but it will skip the first n elements of that input stream and then return the rest of it as the output stream. So in this case, I'm going to skip the first two lines of the file and then pass that to limit, and I'm going to limit how many elements on the input stream are returned on the output stream to two. So I'm going to get lines three and four of my file. I then pass that stream to collect again, but this time, rather than collecting it to a list, I can use another method called collectors.joining. What that will do is it will simply concatenate those strings together and return that as a result. And there's another version of joining, which is an overloaded version, where you can specify another string which you can use as a separator. So if I wanted to create comma separated values from that, all I'd have to do is in the joining just put in comma in double quotes, and that would create comma separated values for me. So things like that become very, very simple. Now, this is a good example because what's not going to happen here is if I have a thousand lines in my file, what won't happen is that I will read all 1,000 lines of the file, pass that to skip, which will return 998 lines of the file, which will then pass that to limit, which will then return two lines of the file. No. The code is smart enough to know that when it sees skip and limit, it looks at it and goes, ah, you actually only need to read four lines of the file. Because once you've read four lines of the file, you're done. So don't worry about it being inefficient. It will evaluate what needs to be done internally. OK, uh, what about if I want to collect all the words in a file into a list? Not the, the lines, the words. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my lines again. And this time I'm going to pass it to flat map. Remember, flat map is a one-to-many mapping. So each element on the input stream creates a stream of results that we want to concatenate. So what we do here is we use a lambda expression where the input is a line, which we know is a type stream, so we don't specify it. And then the right-hand side of the lambda expression is to use stream.of, which will create a new stream of results, stream of, based on splitting the line using some regular expression. So like spaces and tabs, whatever, we can split it up. So the output of that is a stream of all the words from our file. We'll pass that into filter where we just eliminate any zero length words. So if we've got like double spaces or double tabs, we can eliminate those. Pass that into collect, collectors.to list, we get the list of all words. Let's be really clever. How about if I want to take my file, I want a list of all the unique words in lowercase sorted by length. So now what I'm going to do, same thing, take my lines from my file, my source, pass that into flat map to split it up into the individual words, pass it to filter to eliminate the zero length words, pass that into map to convert it to lowercase using the method reference, so string up to lowercase, pass that into distinct, so we'll eliminate any duplicates, pass that into sorted, and sorted we can actually specify a comparator for, so we'll use the same comparator we saw earlier, where we're using x and y results of the, uh, the length comparison, and then pass that into collectors.toList. So this, is, to me, is a very good example, because certainly, if you're not familiar with Lambda expressions in the Streams API, from Java perspective, you look at that and you go, whoa, that looks kind of really foreign to me. You know, suddenly we've got these arrows and double colons and things like that. And we've got all this map and flat map and filter and blah, 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 what is all that about? Don't worry, because once you start using these things, you will find this becomes very natural very quickly. And something like that, if you try and write that code without using streams, if you try and do that code in Java SE 7, you'll find there's a lot more than the sort of eight lines of code that we've got here. So it's a very powerful way of doing quite complex things with collections of data. <coughs> 
And then just to kind of highlight that, this is, again, this is a piece of code I actually reading temperature data for me. And it was a serial sensor connected over a serial connection, which basically sent me a series of lines of text which had the temperature on them in Fahrenheit with a capital F at the end. What I wanted was the temperature in Celsius. And what I also wanted to do was to have a listener that I could potentially associate with my code, which would be notified if the temperature changed, but only if the temperature changed. And this is what I came up with. So I took my thermal reader, got a buffered reader associated with it, I created the lines from that. Now, interestingly here, what we're dealing with is, is actually an infinite stream. So the stream will carry on forever, as long as the sensor is connected, as long as the application is running. What I then did was I said, okay, map that to double, because I want to get the value of the temperature, where I said, okay, pass the double, but chopping off the capital F at the end of the stream. So I've just got the, the numeric value, pass that into a double, and pass that to map. I then used map to convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Pass that into filter to determine whether the temperature has changed or not. So only values that have changed from the previous one will be passed into the next thing. Now I've used another thing here called peak. Now peak is a really useful little um, method because what it does is it actually takes the input stream and passes it directly to the output stream. So it doesn't modify it but it allows you to look at it as it goes past. So in this case, what I did was I said, okay, use peak, and for the values that are coming through, and here I used an optional, where I said, if I had a, an optional listener, so the temperature listener, if it was present, so I had registered a listener, so it was not null, then send, call the method on that listener saying that the temperature had changed with the new value. And then to terminate the stream, to make sure that it actually did have a terminating uh, part to it, I said, for each element that comes through, simply change the current temperature to be the new temperature. And this is, this is actually where I discovered this um, reference to this, because this is where I changed the current temperature. And I thought, well, great, it works. It shouldn't work. And so I looked into it, and this is effectively what has happened, because it adds in this dot current temperature for you. So in this case, it works fine, because it's a serial piece of code, I'm only changing the value from one thread so it doesn't get confused. But that to me was a very nice sort of example of how you can use it in a real world situation. So just to conclude, um, Java really needed language statements. Um, it really needed them to enable us to develop the Streams API and allow this more functional style of programming. Um, there's, there's a lot more that you can learn about functional programming. There's a lot more detail about how to think differently in terms of using that. But it really is powerful. It really is a way of getting a lot of work done in a, in a small amount of code. So having introduced Lambda expressions, we needed extension methods or default methods on interfaces, which we did. And then that allowed us to create Streams API, as you've seen. So what we did with Java SE8 was really to evolve the language, the libraries, and the virtual machine all at the same time. And you will see this continue in the future. So one of the nice things about Java, even though it's basically 20 years old now, is we are still adding new features to it, which are you know, powerful new features that allow you to do things in radically different ways. And that is basically it for my talk. So um, thank you very much. I don't know if anybody's got any other questions or questions about that. Peter Shaman. How are you? Fine? Yes. This is a general question to you. Uh, what you have told about the Lambda expression functional program. And as you know, uh, there are many functional languages that people are using like Scala. And Scala runs on Java. Yes. Now if you compare the scalability and the performance, uh, how do you differentiate uh, the Lambda features of Java with Scala? Or we can incorporate the functionality of Scala and Java in a singular platform and make an interface and implement that interface. Yeah, um, it's, it's a bit difficult to make a like-for-like -like comparison because it's kind of like comparing Java versus native code. But one of the things that we did specifically with Lambda expressions is we didn't implement them simply as syntactic sugar. So what we could have done is we could have said, right, for every Lambda expression, you can rewrite that as an equivalent anonymous in a class. So we could have just generated an anonymous in a class from the Lambda expression, compiled that as we had before. But that wouldn't have taught us anything in terms of performance improvement. 
So what we did was we took advantage of the fact that in JDK 7, we introduced the invoke dynamic bytecode. What that allows us to do is effectively defer how we execute the Lambda expression until runtime. So we don't have to build it into the compiled code. What we're effectively saying is, we're using both dynamics, so at runtime, we can decide which is the best way to actually execute that Lambda expression. So we could do it as the equivalent of anonymous in a class. We could do it as a static method, we could use dynamic proxies with new method handles. There's a whole host of ways that we can do Lambda expressions at runtime. And by doing it that way, we can take the best approach at runtime. So, like I say, it's a bit difficult to compare it with Scala, but you'll find that certainly the way that we've done Lambda expressions in Java is going to be very, very uh, like comparable to how they, they work in Scala. So, um, you know, from a functional perspective, uh, performance is not an issue. Uh, with, uh, <coughs> you know, dynamic. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, during at the runtime, is it is really going to create an anonymous class? Or? Well, it could do, yes. Yeah, so in um, what that, cases it will create and in what cases it won't? Um, that I can't really answer because that's basically built into the JVM. The JVM makes certain decisions about how to do things. I, I honestly don't understand what they've used as a, a sort of criteria for deciding when to do anonymous in classes, when to do static methods, method handles, and so on. But I know that by deferring it, it means that if we want to improve performance, we can do that in the JVM versus having to change the way the compiler works. So it, it does mean that we, we're more dynamic in that yeah. sense. One more question. Yep. Uh, so, uh, like, debugging is... <laughs> <laughs> right, debugging, that's, that's a very good question as well. Um, debugging becomes a little bit challenging in certain situations because obviously you've got Lambda expressions and, and when you look at stack traces, they can be a bit kind of icky um, because you've got all these Lambda um, things put in. Um, one of the things I find is peak is really useful. For, it's kind of like the printf of debugging things. Because what you can do is you can put a peak in and then literally put a print statement inside your peak. So you can see what values are going through at that point in your stream. And so you can kind of use that to, to help with debugging. But that is one area that we are looking at more actively. This is how can we make it easier to do debugging for Lambda expressions because of the, the complexity of the way that the code works underneath. Yeah. Uh, so, coming from languages which sort of take first class functions for granted, uh, one of the things we see is a lot of the traditional design patterns in Java just boil down to using higher order functions. Right? So, is there any documentation or guides which sort of relook at the traditional design patterns from the lens of first class functions and default interfaces? Um, not yet. Um, I mean, there are a number of books that have been written about Lambda expressions and the streams API. People have kind of um, started doing that, but we don't have anything that like Oracle have written where we've explicitly done, you know, looks at how you can could even reinvent certain patterns in that way. Um, so, I mean, unfortunately, the answer is no at the moment. Sorry, Last question. Yeah. One of the primary agents to use Lambda is to leverage the multi core. CPU architecture. So in that case, how are we leveraging that in the kind of programming constraints that we have? We have filter, map, filter, but they are all sequential operations. Ah, no, they're not. See, that's the thing. So if you take if you take a, a stream and you either create a parallel stream from a collection, for example, but you can also take a sequential stream and you can convert it to a parallel stream. So at any point you can take your stream and go dot parallel and that will convert it into a parallel stream. Filter and map are very good examples, like I say, of where you can decompose those into parallel operations because both filtering and mapping are independent, uh, or, or any operation in filter or map is independent. So you can map all your objects at the same time. You don't have to worry about the results from one mapping affecting another one. So the code, if it knows it's a parallel stream, will execute it in, in parallel. So it'll use the fork join framework internally, it will decompose it into parallel operations. Same thing with filter. Even with something like a sort, it will try to do that as best it can. But things like sort don't decompose so well into parallel operations. So we can only do what we can do in parallel. So, um, but they do definitely work uh, very well for, for parallel operations. It's hidden underneath. Okay, I'm, I'm going to have to wrap it up there. I'm going to be around uh, during lunch anyway. So if uh,